Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to remind everybody about the basic rules of the college first. And that is we'll have a, it'll consist of the following format. We'll have a brief, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then after that, we'll have our speaker who will speak for up to about an hour or thereabouts. Then we'll have our question uh, period. We would like you to get a question rather than a, a speech at that point because after this question period, you'll each get a chance to come on up and uh, spot off your activism or your or yourself or on or off subject. Usually it's about four minutes each. My name is Tim. I'll be... Uh, Moderating tonight with the help of Andy Anderson. Let's uh, uh, we'll now proceed to introduce our speaker, University of Illinois Unix, founder of the Freshwater Lab, lead investigator of the Glade Lakes Global Midwest Grant. The Freshwater Lab is an initiative to communicate Great Lakes water issues to the general public, create tools to visualize the current state and future scenarios of water sources, engage unaffiliated groups in water planning and train a new generation of Great Lakes leaders. As we focus on the Great Lakes Basin, we also reach outward to build relationships with water stewards from other parts of the world. Current projects include Good Water Neighbors, Human Right to Water, Oil Pipelines in the Great Lakes, Environmental Justice, Water Delivery and Lead Pipes, Water Diplomacy, and a whole lot more. Let us give a rousing round of applause to Dr. Rachel Haverlock, from the University of Illinois. All right. It's hard water. We need water now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Nice to be here. I'm just going to get this little advertisement out of our frame and uh, just make sure I can navigate where we want to go. Um, I'm going to show you a video in just a moment, but since I can tell this is a group that is political in nature, perhaps I'll get right to the point in case your attention flags. And the point is that right now the Illinois state legislator is in session. And shall we call him Governor uh, Bruce Rauner oh has a proposal in which would facilitate the process of privatizing municipal water systems. Um, fingers crossed, this is not at present and hopefully will not be an issue in the city of Chicago, but across the state of Illinois, a multinational corporation that goes by the name of American Water and um, when they're at work in Illinois, they're called Illinois American Water. They are buying up municipal water supplies. When a multinational corporation buys up municipal water supplies, it means a few things. It means, first of all, that a multinational corporation is claiming the right to draw either subterranean water that comes from an aquifer or surface water that comes from a river or a lake. That corporation also, when it acquires a municipal system, gives itself the right to initiate and conduct all of the billing. So all of the ratepayers, as well as the water itself and the infrastructure, comes under the auspice of a private corporation. From the reports that we have, Every time this has happened, the, the water bills have skyrocketed, skyrocketed anywhere from 10 to 80 yeah. percent. Uh, the service time, so when you've got a problem or a leak with your water, usually if you call, uh, in cases where water has been privatized, that service has um, gone up to be anywhere between a 50 to an 80 percent longer wait. So essentially, it means usually what happens with privatization, that you lose certain rights, right? The right to water, the right to be delivered with water. Uh, the rates skyrocket because the corporation, in this case, Illinois American Water, becomes answerable to its shareholders, not to the people receiving it, and the service um, goes down. 
So this has happened in several cases um, in the state of Illinois. Prominently, a few cities that have experienced water privatization by Illinois American Water are suing to remunicipalize their water. Um, this is the case in Bolingbrook, Illinois, uh, in Peoria, and in most cases um, where um, municipalities have privatized, there is usually a call to get your water back. But the issue is, is that it's harder to get your water back after privatization than it is to try to hang on to your public water um, while it remains public. So if I'm going to distill this, and I'm sorry I didn't write the, the bill number down, um, but right now in the Illinois state legislature, there is a bill to make it easier to privatize. It's been introduced by the governor. Uh, if you want more information, if you want to make a call about that, um, either I can get more information for you afterwards, or an excellent organization in this regard is Food and Water Watch and you can get um, their alerts. Um, on a positive note, this trend of what we call remunicipalizing water, right, trying to bring water back to the public after it's been privatized, is now turning into a global movement. Um, uh, prominently, um, Cochabamba, um, uh, a city in South America, um, it took th the death of three people and massive protests and violence for their water uh, to be remunicipalized. And in Europe, where water privatization happened before North America, there's now a massive uh, transnational movement to get water back. But here we are uh, in the state of Illinois, and uh, luckily for most of us, in the Great Lakes Basin, meaning that we have the right to receive water from the Great Lakes, uh, we still have, in many, many cases, public water. So we want to keep the bill. We want to make it harder, not easier, for water to be privatized. I think it probably goes without saying that we do not want Bruce Rauner in office, uh, that anyone who drinks water or breathes air does not benefit uh, from this governorship. Um, but you also want to make sure that the city of Chicago and surrounding areas hang on to public water. When your water is delivered by a department or um, a utility, I am not saying they're perfect, but it is answerable to you. Um, and the rates have to be maintained in some kind of relationship to the cost of living. Um, Illinois American Water is working fast. You can see it in a drive through the state with their water towers going up. Um, even in Urbana-Champaign, where I, I think um, that they should know better. So this is, um, to get right to the point of this presentation, um, my major call here is to keep water public. It is one of the longest standing and last remaining public services in a time when education, health care, so many things are being acquired by multinational corporations. Water remains something that is one of the historically longest standing commons, meaning that it belongs to everyone that lives in a particular basin. Uh, does anyone know what a basin is? Should I, uh, you want to give us a definition there loudly? I, I think you're referring to uh, the area that is drained by a particular water or water, you know. Absolutely system. right. Absolutely right. So the idea of a basin is it's basically a kind of a boundary that's drawn by rain. So for example, if you are uh, in the city of Chicago, when it rains, that, those raindrops will, will ultimately make their way into Lake Michigan. If you're on the other side of the subcontinental divide that runs down Harlem Avenue, like in the Oak Park area, that means that basin is the Mississippi River Basin. It means when a drop of rain falls there, it's most likely to end up in the Mississippi. So thinking about the basin is different than thinking about national borders. Right, which divide people in an arbitrary fashion. In contrast, the basin says everyone living 
and a particular area in which the rain falls and drains that way has the same vested interest in a clean, secure, and reliable water supply. So for those people in the city of Chicago, um, your basin is Lake Michigan. So what I want to do um, now with the, with the remaining time is I want to make available to you a resource, a website that's called freshwaterstories.com. If anyone wants a way to remember it, I brought some cards there. And basically, we created this website in order to gather information and also make information about the water supply available. I think I will just begin by showing you a quick video, and then we'll undertake some of the exercises together, and I can then make the information available to you. Away. Okay, so we set up a way of thinking about local water systems, and we call it thinking in terms of the source of one's water, the path that it takes to reach you, and the people. In terms of what I was speaking earlier, how many people are connected by a given source of water, and who receives the greatest benefits of being near that source of water, and who faces the greatest risks. So let's just begin a little bit by thinking about the source of our water, and let's um, engage this together. So, um, and people can just call out. So what's the source of drinking water for your home? Lake Michigan. Okay, how many Lake Michigan people are in the room whose water comes from Lake Michigan? No. 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 Okay, I guess no. they're very particular. I'm going to follow the college rules. Um, and people in here whose water doesn't come from Lake Michigan? Okay, do you know the source of your water? Fox River and a deep well out in McHenry County. Okay. All right. Have you ever visited your water source? So if your answer is yes, yes. put up your hands. Uh, anyone that's never visited their water source? And is there, uh, for you sir, is there a reason? I never even saw of them. Okay, all right. Um, and this matters quite a bit because in some parts of the world, in some parts of the country, people haven't visited their water source because it's restricted. So in some cases, um, uh, as in Western Michigan, where, for example, the Nestle Corporation is uh, just received a permit from the state of Michigan to double its rate of withdrawal and here's a bonus question for you how much do you think that the nestle corporation for its ice mountain brand which is simply taken from the municipal water supply of a small rural community in Ose osceola county in michigan how much do you think nestle pays for the water itself a year. Zero. Okay, so the, I heard the right answer. $200 a year is what the Nestle Corporation pays to the state of Michigan in order to withdraw um, 400 gallons per minute of water to bottle in the Ice Mountain brand. Now, I'm actually originally from Michigan, and I did see a lot of ice there, but I never saw a mountain uh, that they bottle um, as Ice Mountain. And it's important to realize that the Nestle Corporation makes 200% profit on every single bottle of water that it sells. It pays $200 again a year for all of the water, and it is also subsidized by, against their will, by the taxpayers of Michigan. 80,000 people wrote in comments during the period when Nestle's permit to double their water extraction um, was underway. Bottled water is not your friend. Uh, first of all, it is an accelerating way in which public water becomes privatized. Second of all, it creates growing pits and mountains of plastic for which the corporations pay nothing to deal with. Instead, the cost of recycling or storing those bottled water, uh, those empty bottles of water, gets put back on you. 
And then the plastic, when it degrades, it never disappears, it becomes very small microplastics that end up again in our water supply. If that is not enough for you, well, I'll ask it as a question. Why do most people drink bottled water? Because there's convenience. They convenience or they think it's cleaner. Or they believe that it is cleaner or healthier. Right. This has to be one of the greatest um, uh, hoaxes in um, 20th and 21st century human history. Because oftentimes, if it's Ice Mountain, it comes from the Osceola supply. If it's Aquafina, it comes from the tap of Detroit, Michigan, where <laughs> residents um, have had their water cut off, as Aquafina has an unlimited right of withdrawal. Right? People have literally had their right to water abrogated um, if they were anywhere from 7 to 27 to a few hundred dollars behind in their water bill as Aquafina um, withdraws it. Uh, so in any case, whether it's the many forms that Nestle takes, Perrier, San Pellegrino, Ice Mountain, um, Aquafina, or Dasani, which is Coca-Cola and has its own um, terrible history. The most interesting thing about bottled water is that it is marketed as being somehow healthier than the water you get from your tap. Um, now we'll talk about pipes in a moment, but at the intake, for example, and in the Chicago Department of Water Management, that water is tested 24 hours a day. Now, we'll talk about pipes, because that's another issue, but at the intake, it's tested 24 hours a day. Because if a lot of people get sick from Chicago water, it's traceable, and the lawsuit would be tremendous. Uh, bottled water, in contrast, is regulated only as a commodity when it crosses state lines. That means that rather than being tested at the intake or in the bottles, it is tested, I mean, it is regulated when there's a large warehouse filled with uh, cartons and plats of bottled water. Someone will walk through, kind of a state investigator, will walk through and nod um, at this water. So it is tested less than municipal water at the same time that um, the plastic can reach into the bottle itself not to mention the fact that we are, um, are stuck with it. So um, I did want to say on that note, there is uh, a worldwide call because of Ice Mountain and several other reasons to boycott Nestle products. Uh, I myself am a proponent of that. Every time I see an Ice Mountain bottle myself, it causes me tremendous pain. Um, also because I contribute to the lawsuit of um, Osceola County and this is, uh, right, this is not a county known for its progressive politics. Right? This is a rural western Michigan community that has gathered all the money it has and that it doesn't have um, in an ongoing court case against the Nestle Corporation. How about the Fuji? Okay, question Oh, um, yeah, Fuji um, water, um, I know that they call that like the artisan one. Um, and I don't know exactly where they're bottling it, but I do know that its regulation is no different from any other. Doesn't it come from the other side of the All way? right, let's go on with the... Okay. No, no, no um, okay. questions a question, period. Okay, got it. I see you guys are rigid about this. I will stick with it. Okay, the next um, mode of inquiry into one's water is this whole question about its path. Uh, this is the question of pipes, of course, very much in the news, hopefully, and on all of our minds because of the Flint water crisis. I'm happy to speak about that as well, but let's think a little bit about PATH. So we include here a kind of a map to understand the issue of pipes. Because when we get into pipes, we get into a strange mix of uh, social power that is embedded underground. Because the pipes that uh, are known as the mains that run along the road uh, like this, those um, are either run by a city or a utility, in some cases, I, as I mentioned before, by a private corporation. Um, and then there is a part, as 
that mane takes a turn towards individual homes, there's a part of that that is again run by the municipality or the corporation. Where it gets a little bit sticky is that the service line, right, oh here we are, the service line that runs into homes in current American law falls under the auspices of private property. So it means that your water supplier is responsible for maintaining the intake, for maintaining the pipes as it comes to you, but then as it crosses into, uh, into the property itself, that falls under the jurisdiction of um, the homeowner or the landlord. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because this is a really big issue right now in the city of Chicago, because as you might have noticed, the streets are being um, torn up and the pipes are being replaced. Um, this is a project for which the city has a, a took out a loan of some $760 million. And the reason, which again does, is not a bad one, is because those pipes were old and in many cases were leaking and losing a lot of water. Okay, that is what it is. But Chicago was the last city in the United States to mandate lead service lines. Again, those lines that come in. It was mandatory to use a lead service line for individual homes or for um, multi-family units, not big buildings, but um, something like six units or more, it was mandatory to use a lead pipe up until 1987. Uh, some plumbers with whom I've spoke said, well, we had to stop by law in 87, but some people still had the materials and used it. Which means that about 80% of residences, including my own, in the city of Chicago have a lead service line right here. Now, I'll tell you the good news and I'll tell you the bad news. The good news is, is that the Chicago Department of Water Management knows this to be the case, and they add phosphate to the water, which acts as an anti-corrosive. It hopefully keeps the pipes from leaching lead into our water. The bad news is that all of the research about changing water mains, which is going on all over the city, is that when some part of this pipe system is jostled, right, that it um, creates a situation in which the pressure changes and the system changes, and it is a case in which lead in a lead pipe is more likely to break off into the water, okay? So the city knows, um, but we've also got a whole lot of lead pipes. Um, if I am going to speak to you um, right now, the first thing I'd say is filter your water. And the filter that you want, it's on this website here on the story about lead pipes, but it's um, NSF, um, slash ANSI, A-N-S-I, um, I'll look at the, the number in a minute, 48 to 51. You're going to want to filter your water. I have suggested in, in many places where I've spoken, I said, you know, and while you're buying a water filter, why not send a bill to the city and say, while there's no program um, to help people replace these lead service lines, here's my bill. But the other issue um, about this whole thing, people would say, well, it's your pipe on your property, so pay for it. I um, have spent a lot of time getting estimates myself from plumbers, and the city says replacing a lead service line should be some eight to $10,000. I was unable to find a plumber that would quote anything less than $15,000, in some cases 27, and in some cases 53. So replacing this little pipe is obviously cost prohibitive to the great um, number of people. Um, and so there's a story on here, and again, I'll give you the card and give you the information for those who are interested. Um, but the story on here about lead pipes argues that thinking in terms of private property when it comes to lead service lines is the incorrect approach. 
that rather um, the approach should be of one, that the city should do no harm, um, two, that it should approach it. Now, private property means if you own property, you have the right to say to someone, get off my property. But it does not release the city or for those people with um, corporate water, the corporation, from making sure that that water is supplied to homes and ratepayers um, in a way, in a manner that is safe um, for everyone, including the most um, vulnerable people. So the principle that many people are saying is that with lead pipes, it should be do no harm. And that instead of saying, okay, you've got a lead pipe, it's your problem, that we need to start exploring um, some kind of cost-sharing program so that as all of these water mains in Chicago are switched, that we also make sure that we don't leave most of the populace on the end of a very dangerous lead straw. Okay. Um, these we've kind of been through for those in the city of Chicago. Um, uh, again, it's city government, the Department of Water Management. But this is a very important question because many people who experience water privatization don't know. And so we put this question on here for people to start to look and figure out who um, runs their water pipes. Um, okay, let's see how many people even know this. Um, how many people know that the service line going into their home is made of lead? Okay, it's quite a few of us. Uh, how many people copper? Okay, steel? Clay? Uh, concrete? PVC? Or I don't know. Okay, so we also have on here a tool, in case you don't know what your pipe is made of, um, we've got a tool on this page, uh, pretty easy, you just need like a magnet and your eyes and a few things and a coin, um, and in that way you can figure out what your service line is, is made of. Okay. Um, all right, the, the final piece that I'll, that I'll show you here is this whole question about people. <laughs> Um, because, of course, water and its infrastructure uh, also exists in human communities. Um, okay, so let's do a quick, let's do a quick one to five about, um, usually I do one to ten, but I know that time is short. Um, so how many people feel um, very low, like a one? They don't know if their water is safe to drink. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you're at a one, a couple people there at a one. How many people are at a two? Okay, how many people at a three? Uh, no, I'm not feel uh, insane. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, yeah, no, you did the right one. I got it. How many people are at a four, feeling fairly confident about their water? No. Okay, and five? Yeah. People definitely. very confident? Okay. okay. Good, good red water. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and then here, um, I'll just ask it if anyone has a, a specific answer. Um, anyone uh, know that there's been a recent or historical health scare? related to water in your area? Of course. Okay. And do you want to share? Um, it uh, starts with a C. It's that little bug that was in the water uh, in Milwaukee and uh, caused a really terrible uh, problem with digestion. Can you do you remember that? I, I don't, but I'll certainly look into it. I mean, part of why we have this question is we also have a place. No, I don't yeah. mean cholera. It's uh, a cryptosporidium. 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 Yeah. Cryptosporidium. Okay. okay. I mean, that's just why we have the question here. There's also a place to enter in the data because it's a way for people who are experiencing this to report it somewhere. I gotta get because um, they took all that. Okay. Uh, okay. So then, let's just think about this for a moment. So, in what neighborhood or community are the water risks most acute? Who's most affected? Disadvantaged. Okay, so we hear disadvantaged, yep. Probably young people. Okay, young people when it comes to lead pipes, certainly. Um, the young are most vulnerable to that. The Calumet area, so places uh, with historical industry that hasn't been cleaned up, exactly right. Wheeling and Northbrook. Wheeling and Northbrook? Wheeling and Northbrook. Why so? Iron. Lots of iron in their water. Oh, iron is in the water itself? Yeah, from the municipality. Oh, interesting. Okay. The southeast side. The southeast side. Um, so, in general terms, which is not to say that um, 
right? There aren't uh, risks and benefits that are spread out, but usually the uh, lowest quality of water and the most acute risk uh, overlaps with low-income communities and particularly low-income communities of color. So, you know, there is a way in which class and race and exposure to pollutants uh, overlap. And this, um, you might have heard in the video, Dr. Antonio Lopez um, spoke about this, is um, the next thing that we do is sort of who's working on these risks? Because, it, you know, what I said, the way in which race and class and uh, risk and exposure to toxins often coincide, it's important to also know that at the neighborhood level, at the city level, and at the regional level, there are many groups, and I know that people in this room are engaged with a, a good number of them, there are local groups on the ground gathering data advocating for themselves and making changes. And so we created um, also a resource to sort of find out what people are doing and how, um, and how one can help. Uh, just to make uh, available to you, just so you can see, uh, so those are our questions, right? Those are the ways in which we uh, engage people. And we also have uh, quite a few resources on here. Uh, it'll come up in a moment. First, we uh, bring up the idea of the commons, that this is your lake, your water, your future, and it needs you. And then we show this image of a single drop of water and how a, a, any single drop of water is implicated in our food production, in how we generate energy, and what energy generation does to the water, in health, and also a community connections. And then what we have here, what we have here, um, and I will let you, uh, the different speakers, determine, what we have here are 12 stories written by different leaders of the Great Lakes water movement that explain the issue in understandable terms, uh, have polls to get people's input and information, and every single story ends with three concrete actions that, um, that can be taken. So I think there's some moving around here, so maybe I will move to the side. Um, at your request, we can explore any of these stories. Um, and I can also make them available to you through the web address and with these cards. Thank you. All right. Andrew, are you ready? Okay, he's going to help you with the okay. question. Can you moderate for a few minutes while I eat? Um, Andy, it always happens. Just go ahead. Uh, just to take a few minutes. Uh, all right, just go ahead and uh, we're taking questions now. Please raise your hand and uh, if you have a question. Go ahead. Okay, and do you want, okay. You want, go, go ahead and take care of it. Okay, sure. What about the case where you have to buy uh, distilled water? Is there any other alternative other than medical Um With distilled water? Well, you oh. need for seat pack for the machines. For the sleeping machines, uh, you have to have distilled water for yeah. Oh, for those? Yeah, so yeah. you can't use regular water. How do you uh, have to buy a bottle of water, right? Oh, in order to get it distilled? Um, so there, the question, uh, please. Uh, the question was what to do about distilled water. Um, I mean, I, I, now this might not be as serious, but like when I iron, um, I just use my filtered water. Um, I filter for quite a few things, so I use it in that case. What kind of filter do you use? Okay, so um, let me show you. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So let me show you um, a few different things about that. So on the issue of, um, of filtering, let me show you a few things. If you are mostly concerned, sorry, story, here we go. Okay, so if you are mostly concerned about lead, then, as well. Okay, hang on. I'm going to show you guys. It takes a minute or two to refresh. I'm sorry about that. Okay, no, no worries. Just trying to, I just want to scroll down. Okay, there we go. 
Okay. So if you're worried, just use the speed. If you are worried primarily about lead, then what you want. Okay, what you want if you're worried about lead is right here. It's NSF, ANSI, either 42 or 53. And um, this, like, so on my sink in my bathroom, I've got a filter. It's by a company called Culligan. Wasn't more than 20 some dollars and maybe a $16 filter. It's so, the same for the kitchen? Okay, so yeah, this is if you're worried about lead. Like if you want, if you have a lead pipe and you know it, you, this is the filter that you want. If you want to filter for other things, and we can talk about some of those other things in our, yeah. If you want to filter for other things in our area, the greatest, um, the maximum filtration that you can do is a triple osmosis filter. Um, that you put in under the sink. That's what I have under my sink. Triple okay. osmosis. Um, the other thing that I want to make available to you uh, is that the Environmental Working Group. Sorry, that. Sorry. For this. What's that? Okay, I just want to get everyone for their filter. Um, is that the Environmental Working Group also has a tool that we include here on drinking water in which you can put your zip code and you can see what the pollutants are and what the source is. And then you can, so right here you can see it, it's uh, the ewg.org slash tap water database and you can literally put in your zip code and it will show you what's in the water. Now they don't know about your lead pipes, but you can see the contaminants and you can also follow it through to find the best filter. Because so next, in the back, okay, next question. Uh, lead's really the only thing that's uh, dangerous in, in someone's water. Um, and one, and then my second, uh, my question is, what are the EPA standards for your average Joe Blow house that has lead pipes and there hasn't been construction or pipe changes, <laughs> what's the EPA guidelines parts per uh, million or billion or what have you for lead? And, and what, how does the average average house, how bad is it? I, I always thought it was underneath, it was as well within the EPA guidelines. Okay. Lead isn't that big of a problem unless there's like construction in the neighborhood. Um, you gotta run your faucet over <laughs> okay, so um, the first thing, I mean, the lead pipes are a problem, but it's not the only one. Um, the other issue that we have right now is that in April 2017, the U.S. steel plant near Gary, Indiana, uh, had a massive leak. And they also lied about it. Um, they did not report um, the leak. What leaked into the water over there near Burns Harbor was hexavalent chromium, uh, also known as the Aaron Brockovich compound. Um, and so U.S. Steel lied. They didn't report. And it's the Indiana, which, you know, they don't care. They don't care. Um, there's now a few different lawsuits right now. Um, in one kind of interesting turn, the um, surf rider, the lake surfers, who were not known, you know, for being political in nature, initiated the lawsuit against U.S. Steel because they go out in that water and, and they're exposed. Is it so, showing up in the in the pipelines? Um, I believe so. Um, uh, is there anything else dangerous besides lead? You know, there's a lot. There's dangerous things. I don't know if you need to know more than one. For a complete list of what's dangerous, go to a website. She's broadcast websites. We have a lot of people who have questions. Okay. Who's next? Right there. You go behind. Okay, so what, you didn't, she didn't answer my question. What's the website you can go to? Okay, so how, for, how, where are we at as far as EPA oh, okay. guidelines? Okay, so That's the EPA question. guidelines, yeah. So the EPA guidelines, I mean, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because we now, at the point of intake, at the, um, at the Jardine intake, we don't have a problem with lead. 
yeah. right? And where the problem is are in, in these individual houses. Um, to figure that out where we stand, I recommend a recent article by Michael Hawthorne of the Chicago Tribune because they went and followed up with people who had tested their water and it um, ranged from anywhere um, within the guidelines to like a thousand times over. So that really where we stand um, really fluctuates from house to house. So it's hard to... Okay, we have to move on. You, yes. How can I get my water tested? What's that? Okay. Okay, so how to get the water tested. This again is not the answer that I wish to give you. Um, you can go on the city of Chicago and request a, um, a, a kit to test your water. I did it maybe three months ago. I do not have any, um, any test kit that's come. So I'm still waiting on that, uh, but the city does say that they're available. Uh, you, I also, I put in the request, I had to put it in about three or four more times. Like I said, I'm still waiting for my kit. Uh, the other thing to do is to turn to a private, um, you know, you can either try to get your own kit and see where you stand, but there are also testing services um, that you can go to. The lady in front, the lady with the blue hair. Thank you. That's well, true. Yeah. Well, I, I, did, I did not want the uh, comment that lead is the only dangerous thing in water to pass. And uh, I, uh, I'm a full-time anti-nuclear activist, and radium is extremely soluble in water. Okay, so let me repeat it so everyone hears. Um, so, um, and tritium, uh, tritium is leaking out of nuclear power plants uh, over on the other side of the lake all the time. And it goes so let me, um, let me bring this point up. Um, so the, uh, the speaker right now is an anti-nuclear activist. Um, there are nuclear plants um, uh, around Lake Michigan. There's a very controversial um, case right now, um, a, an attempt in Ontario, Canada to store, uh, use nuclear materials on Lake Huron. So she did not want to let pass that lead was the only issue. I had brought up hexavalent chromium from the U.S. steel plant, and, um, and she made the point that there also are leakages of radium and iridium from the nuclear plants. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, right. So we had a guy who spoke here a few years ago on Earth Day, a plumber. It reminded me of Ed, like Ed Norton. All right. <laughs> But he claimed that bottled water was worse than tap water, essentially because of the chemicals they use to clean the equipment. And what I've seen of the food industry cleaning their apparatus at night, there may be some validity in what he said. What do you think, do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, so um, this was a previous speaker at the college mentioned that Ta that bottled water is likely more dangerous than tap water. Uh, I think, first of all, it's likely more dangerous because it's not tested. Um, and second, I think it's more dangerous because of the leaching of the plastics into the water. Uh, this plumber was skeptical because of the kinds of cleansers and chemicals they use in the bottling plants. I think that there is validity to that because, again, what happens inside a Nestle bottling plant is close to us. So how do we know? I mean, if we think about Nestle's practices worldwide, they usually uh, are motivated by the cheapest production and the highest profit. So uh, there's nothing uh, in any kind of bottled water production scenario that would, that would draw me to doubt that. I mean, you are um, most definitely better off with your tap water, although, right, these issues that we're bringing up are real. If they don't disappear just because you put water in a plastic bottle on the one hand, but, you know, the, the way I would say, um, drink your public water, filter your public water, and then, as, as I know that this is a room of activists, right, here's the, here's the activist part. 
and then engage because remember as I said before water is one of these last uh, bastions of the commons like it belongs to all of us and so advocating for our water is advocating for ourselves and our communities and the ecosystem at large um, and you know social health okay in the back yeah oh. Andy Lichtenberg yeah. Uh, please discuss the uh, threats to uh, uh, drinking water of microbeads and the uh, great green toxic algo algo that threatens mostly Lake Erie right now okay okay so um, the first question was about microbeads, uh, and the second one, algal bloom. So let's take the, the microbeads first. So you know, much of our world is constructed out of petrochemicals, right? Um, whether plastic water bottles, clothing, furniture, I mean, uh, plastics, which are petrochemicals, have made their way into almost everything around us. And it's a kind of a compound that doesn't disappear. It could get in smaller and smaller form. Um, but for example, something that um, is prevalent because so many clothes are made of polyester and different kinds of plastics, it means when you do your laundry that those end up um, coming out the drain uh, and then entering the water supply. There's a, a nice thing you can do there. Um, there's something called a guppy bag that some people innovated. So when you have polyester synthetic clothes, you throw those in this bag and it catches the microplastics so they don't make their way in. Not a bad um, sort of a step change. But the other thing to try to do, um, again, there's structural issues, right? Which is trying to struggle against petrochemicals, right? There's the structural issues, but then on the individual level, try not to use plastic. Um, whether it's silverware, bottles, or the like, uh, you know, when I, you go, one goes to the beach on a summer day and there's people enjoying themselves, and then you see what's left there, it's like a sea of plastic, and that ends up uh, in our drinking water. The other issue, and here, this is the story on farming, is uh, about algal blooms or, or algae blooms. This is the result of runoff. Um, and it's in a very strange, uh, or I would say non-regulated frame right now, because you know we're holding on. There still is uh, the Clean Water Act. Uh, may it live long. Um, but the Clean Water Act only regulates pollution that comes into water out of a pipe. And there's a lot of pollution that comes into water from rains, right? You guys have been noticing the rains are getting stronger um, and more vigorous. And so when you have agricultural fields, golf courses, lawns, uh, that are treated with pesticides and fertilizers, <coughs> there are nutrients in there, phosphorus and nitrogen. And so especially a heavily fertilized lawn, field, uh, farm, that stuff gathers up in the rain, enters into streams and rivers, and runs into the lake. So this is a huge issue, and this picture right here is Lake Erie, which um, just now, after um, probably 10 years too late, has been declared officially impaired. Why? Because there's a whole lot of corn and soy in Ohio and it's not been regulated and it runs off and all of this nitrogen and phosphorus which is necessary for things to live causes these algal blooms. Uh, it's a huge issue. There is one um, that likely will happen again this summer in Green Bay in Lake Michigan near all those farms and so here's another place where there's both structural and individual responses because um, on the structural level, there's a farm bill going through Congress uh, and something like demanding that the water remain viable and that we change uh, how things are fertilized is really necessary. And then the, um, the, the other issue is to try to buy from smaller family farms that are more conscious in how they fertilize because the fertilizer is mostly used by large farms that treat each crop as having a very low value, right? They're going for mass 
rather than um, price. So like, you know, the soy and corn stuff, they don't care about each individual stock. It's more and more and more. So they'll use the fertilizers and pesticides to get that yield. So if you can, in your own food consumption, try to go to those farmers markets, find those family farms that have a vested interest in maintaining the health of the soil and the water. Is there any kind of legislation in the works to try and uh, get like a, a surcharge on bottled waters? It seems bottles of plastic water it seems like it's actually more of a serious problem than plastic bags, and that has that has been instituted. Um, yeah, it's a great idea. So the question was, is there anything about a surcharge on bottled water to deal with the plastics? Um, I'm with you on that. Um, I think that there is reluctance to try it because of um, what was that last year when they tried the soda tax in order to get some money to go into programs for youth health. Um, you know, there was so much money by the beverage industry poured into squashing that, um, so much. So I think that um, people are scared. They're very scared. I mean, the bottled water, any way you slice it, it's going to end take you back to Coke, Pepsi, or Nestle. <laughs> right? These are not your local bottled water. I mean, and which I have to say, like we do, relative to the rest of the world, over 20% of the world's fresh water is in the Great Lakes. Right, so we've got relative to other places more water. So should we have kind of beverages made in this region? Probably we should. Um, I think that makes sense. Um, and you know, you sort of think about something like Napa Valley. You know, the Great Lakes region was like the Napa Valley of water-based drinks. That makes a lot of sense. But then you would want these to be businesses that paid taxes that employed people at a fair wage, right? That, that cared about the health of the water. But the way bottled water is now, it's gonna take you to Coke, Pepsi, or Nestle. They're stronger than most cities and states, so people have not um, looked at what you're talking about, which makes a ton of sense, right? I mean, or they should be forced to run the recycling program, for heaven's sake. Um, I, I love what you said. I am all about it. Um, but I think it would have to go first with some kind of campaign that would bring those corporations uh, into some kind of situation of listening. Sure. Could, could there be water, war, water wars in the future because uh, we have 20% of the fresh water and even here in the United States, the Southwest and uh, the West are short of water. And I heard they want tankers to be sent to Asia with fresh water. Could there, could there be a conflict with that? Okay, so the tankers are not... Does everyone the, get that question? Uh, does everyone get the question? Could there be water wars? Because we've got over 20% of the world's water here. The world's water geography is changing really, really rapidly. So when I said before about, you know, we don't call them even rainstorms anymore. They're not called rain events. Because when it rains, it's so much rain in such a short amount of time that it inundates our uh, infrastructure and other parts of the world are, and even other parts of Illinois, are running out of water. But the water wars question, um, the larger answer is no, actually, for this reason. That the fear of tankers carrying away Great Lakes water and pipelines going to the southwest caused in 2005 a major piece of legislation which is known as the Great Lakes Compact. And the Great Lakes Compact, uh, it was mostly Republican governors at the time of Great Lakes states, um, signed into law by George W. Bush. And basically the Great Lakes Compact says that um, except for a few cases, which I'll tell you in a moment, we're keeping the water in the basin. So instead of sending our water to other parts of the world, the larger plan is, is that people are going to have to come here. Now, the big loophole about the tankers is that you could not, for example, send a tanker filled with Lake Michigan water out of the basin. But guess what? You can send a tanker filled of Nestle Ice Mountain bottles um, out. 
So the Great Lakes Compact is a really, really important piece of legislation. It's got um, a loophole for the Chicago diversion, uh, which we can talk about, which is how we send our wastewater away from us. It's got a loophole for the Chicago diversion. It's got a loophole for bottled water. And it's got another loophole, which is happening right now. So let me tell you about this, because it really, really matters. Um, right now, there's another multinational corporation. You can't make this stuff up, because if you were going to make up the name of a terrible corporation, you would give it the name that it actually has, which is Foxconn. <laughs> and you really can't make this up. So the Foxconn Corporation, um, based in Taiwan, they manufacture LCD screens, like for your cell phones. And they have gone in, in Scott Walker's Wisconsin, and they have negotiated an out-of-basin diversion in order to build a plant um, in uh, southeastern Wisconsin. Now, there, this is happening all right now. There's a big lawsuit. Um, it, if you are, right, someone in a Great Lakes state, as we are, um, call the governor, call Wisconsin. Um, Foxconn's permit still could be denied. Um, but so there are, there is a good piece of legislation that matters quite a bit, this Great Lakes Compact. Um, but there are loopholes, right? There are ways and there are fears that this could get shipped away. So to answer your question, we're probably not going to go to war for our water, uh, but at the same time, we've got to remain vigilant that it's not this corporation here and this town here chipping away at the piece of legislation that keeps water in the basin. Who hasn't uh, had a first question yet? Who hasn't had a first question? Over here. Yes. U.S. Steel wasn't the only place, I believe, that leaked. Wasn't there a big leak from the from the BP oil plant away yeah. a few years ago? Were you at that meeting? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I think I think you might have been there. Yes. Uh, thank you for bringing that up because here I've shown you all these stories written by lovely, um, brilliant writers, but I actually wrote the one on fossil fuels. Uh, this is one of my major interests, um, indeed. Uh, in 2014, I believe, in 2014, April 2014, um, the BP Whiting plant, which um, processes Alberta tar sands, the heaviest, most toxic uh, fuel source uh, on Earth, um, the biggest market for Alberta oil sands or tar sands is the city of Chicago. Uh, that is refined at the BP Whiting refinery. Uh, they have uh, they retrofitted in order to change from crude oil brought in from overseas to this Alberta tar sands. And they were moving increasingly um, to automation. And so as they were bringing on their new refining and new automation, there was another major leak um, of tar sands and the chemicals used to help convey it into Lake Michigan water. This was hugely concerning, largely because it was hardly reported. And also because in the end, um, I was in a group of people who demanded to know what spilled and how much. And I'm sad to say that we never got an answer to that. Uh, when we went to the public meeting, where I think you might have been, when we went to the public meeting, we were told that BP was going to undertake its own investigation. And they were going to get back to us and, and let us know. Um, and so that does leak. About two years after the spill, uh, for our labor organizers here, there was a big strike at that plant. And it was uh, in the coldest months of February. But what was really interesting coming from the workers at the plant is they were on strike for better wages, but also because they were so concerned about all the risks associated with automation in that refinery. And again, as someone said, it's in Indiana, uh, which is um, the, uh, in the state of Indiana has something like uh, 25 miles of coastline. And it's the most polluted and degraded uh, coastline of Lake Michigan. 
And I'll, I'll just add one piece on here. That yeah. coastline was largely deregulated by Mike Pence's brother. Uh, and the Pence family money uh, also comes from Kyle Oil, which has some dealings in this hard star stance uh, economy. Absolutely right. Thanks for bringing that up. Lady in the back. Now that the Thank you. Thank you. Is there a possibility to speak water to that area? And I don't know if you've heard of the Genie Oil Company. Do you believe that would have any role in the planned destabilization of Syria? Okay. And considering the fact that there's a severe lack of water shortage like in the Middle East right now, these oil companies, are they a threat to the local water sector? Okay, so this is a question about the Middle East. And, um, and thinking about, on the one hand, the severe lack of water and safe water available, and I'll, I'll speak to the places I know, but this is a major crisis uh, within Syria, within Iraq, within Jordan, um, insufficient water supply for the population. And if I'm right, the next question was, at the same time, amidst uh, the destabilized situation, in uh, Iraq and Syria, you also have oil companies going in. It's, you know, nothing like it. This is, of course, what Naomi Klein calls disaster capitalism, right? There's, um, when it comes to buying things, assets on the cheap, and exploiting labor and operating um, under an umbrella of deregulation, nothing's better than disaster. Um, and so uh, the question here is amidst the humanitarian disasters in Iraq and Syria, it's also the kind of ideal moment for the disaster capitalists and the oil companies to go in and exploit the oil reserves um, and the labor. And I think the point being made here too is whether it's um, a conventional oil well or is in our area fracking, uh, oil exploration demands a tremendous amount of water. And so these projects, again, are ways in which the general public, uh, no matter uh, how hard pressed to serve their basic needs, ends up subsidizing uh, corporations. That has a really, really long history um, in that whole region because um, Right, the oil industry sort of begins in Iraq and Syria, and the companies gave themselves access to unlimited water. Uh, so that's absolutely what's going on. The question is, um, what does one do? Um, how to bring, um, how to secure a water supply uh, to people in those degraded areas? Um, and it's a hard one. Um, I'm not going to stand up here you know, really quickly and say that there's an answer to it, but maybe I'll have one answer to it. And I would start out by saying, whether we're talking about the Middle East or the Great Lakes, I think the phrase that's really important is resource sovereignty. Um, right, The whole idea that if you live in a basin, it's your water, you have a stake in controlling it. If you're in a place with kind of a oil or rock that can be made into oil, right, that should not automatically belong to a private company, but to the people in that place. So I think especially in this advanced age of exploitation and extraction, the kind of demand, right, that it's our water, it's our energy, is really a kind of a vital political turn. Yeah, question over here. Question over here. Uh, thank you so much. You know, I was waiting a long time, so I have very quick three questions important. What's your question? Question number one. So, then this is water we cannot drink because I'm, this is not with water. No, I drink it. What's the question? Oh, What's so question? Okay. the question is can she drink the water in the glass? I'd say oh, you're. Oh, no. Okay. I say. Uh, <laughs> We're not asking please, you, Charlie. Okay. I mean, Let's keep it down and answer the question, please. Give her another one. My next question. My next question. I drink it. If you ask me, if you handed it to me. What's your other question? So my. So you say it's a drink. I do. My next question. Uh, so can you tell me what kind of water you're using for Pepsi and Coca-Cola? 
Yeah, so I did. So if it's um, Nestle. Okay. Okay. So if it's again Ice Mountain, that's the one that's extracted from our. No, 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 no. Bottled water bad. If we're going to put that tap water better, filtered tap water best. If I'm going to put it in into that form, um, no, it's no good. Is that what they use for Coca-Cola and Pepsi? No. Oh, in the drinks? Yeah. I don't know what they use in the drinks. I'm talking about, um, they're all, um, I mean, I don't know, you know, soft drinks is a different story. Um, I was saying that Coke and Pepsi and Nestle bottle all the water. I would not drink it, whereas I would drink the water in the glass. Okay, and my next question, uh, thank you so much. Um, All right. You really put conversation and controversy. What really you recommend? Hold on, hold on. No, there, there is no safe bottled water. So there, there's the takeaway. There's no safe bottled water because there's no bottled water water that's regulated in the way that you know, next question that's it <laughs> next question no, you, you have to cut it off drink set no safe bottle what you do oh, let me just let me say one thing what you do is you buy a reusable bottle and you filter it in your home and you put it the bottle in your bag you guys could even make a college of complexes right you can get a nice little logo and you could sell them for a few dollars at the thing and then you filter the water at home and you carry it with you who hasn't had a last question we only got time for a couple of questions who hasn't had a first question here you in the back there yeah okay what's your question speak up uh the refineries at HSBC because mobile has the one that uses it in Joliet and Lamont you've got six gold and you got marathon and plus now they're talking about refill putting a new pipeline to replace the old one across Mackinac Street oh yeah 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 I'm sorry that the website I can't get it to move because many of these things are on this page but it's not moving um, thank you I was talking um, about the BP refinery on Lake Michigan. You're absolutely right. I actually am just back from a little trip down the Chicago and Illinois River. And um, my conclusion was like American rivers basically are now pipelines. Uh, they're conveyance systems for petrochemicals. Um, so you're absolutely right. Those are along the Chicago and the and the Illinois um, Illinois rivers. Uh, the pipeline. I want to show you it. Oh, oh, magic. Okay, I want to just show you this really quickly. Um, I just want to show the map. Okay, here we go. So um, again, the, this is a map of the tar sands pipelines as they come into our region. You can see down here when oh sorry when the oh yeah you can see there um, those dots are where oil spills have happened. Um, so you can see that the most dangerous pipeline that many of us are very active around is is this monster right here known as Line Five. Uh, line Five crosses the Straits of Mackinac which is where Lake Michigan and Lake Huron exchange their waters. It was built to be, there's a great documentary where you see one of the original engineers. It was built to be a 50 year pipeline that is now in its 64th year. Um, it leaked this past winter. And um, the people of Michigan are desperately, and really all of us that drink these waters, we are desperately trying to get this pipeline out of our waters. It actually comes through the Straits of Mackinac. It takes Canadian tar sands to a Canadian port. It has no benefit to us. We are desperately trying to get this pipeline out of the water. And should it be successful, it would be the first pipeline that was ever decommissioned. I'm not talking about not built, right, which was the keystone thing that hopefully will hold. Um, but it would be the first pipeline that was ever decommissioned by popular will. Um, you know, you can see there's a big, big pipeline um, going right through Wisconsin, and that is not without issue. It's even um, turning some Republicans um, in a different direction because they're having their land seized by eminent domain. Um, for those we pipelines. We are going to replace that, but it's, mo 
But what they're really talking about is taking it out and putting a new one in. Yes, so that's what the company wants to do. They want to take it as a great opportunity to say, we'll make a much more secure pipeline and we'll also double its capacity. Yeah. That's not what we want. We want it out of the water. If there was a leak, wouldn't you shunt it and a valve on either end? Um, that, is, um, that is what they did in the winter. Um, but what happened, if you see that, this big dot right here, that's the um, Kalamazoo River oil spill. That's, uh, these are all Enbridge pipelines. So that was in 2010. That's the world's largest inland freshwater oil spill. It happened the same summer as, as the BP spill, so it was overshadowed. Here's the problem about turning it off. The um, control centers are in Western Canada. So when this started leaking, um, it was first noticed by the residents of a trailer park nearby the, the water, and they started calling everyone. The police, the fire department, nobody believed them. Then the police and the fire department and the Michigan State Patrol started trying to call the Enbridge guys. But there's some guys in a control tower in Western Canada. So then the shift, the workers, um, there was a shift transfer. And so some guys came in and they saw something wrong on the monitor. And they said, oh, it must be clogged up. So they increased the pressure in Western Canada. So we're talking about a million gallons of oil spilled in this. So they'll, like, they'll just shut it off at a leak. Um, does not make us very confident. And there's a video on here. I won't play it now. Um, but there, and it's gone. What's the name of that town in Kalamazoo. Um, Shut down the PC because it's uh, it, it happens. It, it'll re, it'll okay. reboot up. It'll reboot. Just let it go. Okay, I'm gonna leave it alone. Um, What's the name of the town where that happened? Kalamazoo. Where? Kalamazoo. Okay. okay. Kalamazoo. All right. Okay, everybody, give our speaker a big hand. There's a rebuttal time now. Rebuttal. We're out of question time. I know everybody got more questions. Uh, who wants to give, uh, keep your hands up and we'll get a count, please. But we can't have people straggling up here at 20 to 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's 10 people, maybe 11. Okay. Rebuttal time tonight is going to be three minutes from now. And then the speaker will have about five or six minutes to wrap up, and we have to be out of here by quarter to nine. So with a mob like this tonight, a full house, uh, uh, start wrapping up about 25 to nine so you can move out and we can empty the room by quarter to nine so they can leave. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, and uh, we're gonna start. So if you guys said, just give me a second, I'll get out of your way here. Got to shut everything down real quick. Yeah, please. Um, Thank you guys very much tonight for the discipline on the questions. A couple of years ago, a couple of months ago, a friend of mine came over and he brought filtered water with him and he uh, asked for a glass so he could put tap water in there. So he took the filtered water and he had some sort of a stick like a thermometer and put it in there and the water stayed the same in the filtered water. So when he put it in the glass with the tap water, it looked like dirt inside. And if you ever seen it, you wouldn't want to drink it after that. And that's what's coming through the tap water. As far as um, these corporations are concerned and the government is concerned, the only time the government does something as far as helping the people and there's, if there's a lot of pressure against them, a lot of mass movements against them, and then they start doing something once in a while. If the Republicans are in, they don't do anything at all. The Democrats are in, Democrats will do a little bit so you don't look at them as being part of the corporations. They don't care too much what the people want. What they care about is profits. And of course, the uh, politicians 
for the most part, are paid off. And when they're paid off, they do what they want them to do. So that's what actually capitalism is all about, is not to please the people, but to please the corporations. And you see that in almost every case. For instance, if we look at the downturn in 208 with the bankers and the industrialists, and especially people in the housing market, we're losing a lot of money because of what they've done. The, the, uh, the government under Obama came in and bailed all these people out. But they didn't help many of the homeowners. They helped the bankers. And that's what their uh, modus operandi is all about. They have to support capitalism. And the only time they, like I said, that they do anything, if there's a hell of a lot of pressure that's put on them, and they think if they keep doing what they're doing, they won't be voted in again. That's the people that have the power, if you have enough of them, and enough of them are conscious of what they're doing, then when you get something done. Thank you. He said there's a simple solution. Your liberal will take care of all the pollution. Your liberal will take care of all the pollution. Last week, I, uh, well, I, I, Tim told, told me to bring this up. Okay, last week, uh, 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 Heather didn't give me the bill, and I thought I had paid, so I walked out. I come in today, and Charlie, Charlie accuses me of stiffing her, and then she comes and says I, that I cheated her, and I got the pain in advance, that she don't trust me. I mean, I, I, all they had to do was tell me politely, and, and, and I paid her for last week, I paid her for this week. She said I had to pay her in advance. I want to get this out because she's ruined my reputation. And uh, uh, last week at the rebuttal period, she took all day to she took all day to, to get the bills out. And uh, a lot of times I have to look for her to pay the bill. And, um, and then she really insulted me when she said she can't trust me that I have to pay in advance from now on. And when I said, well, I'm not, I always give her five dollar tip, five dollar tip all the time <coughs> because she works hard. Okay, but then. Um, uh, <clears throat> it was four dollars before. No, no. Uh, Charlie's the one who pushed this. He's the one who who started oh, yeah, this. No, no. Shut up. I'm talking now. No, you're not. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, if they ask, if she asked politely, I, I would have paid her uh, uh, politely. Uh, but but uh, what happened was, uh, I pay all my bills. I got an A1 credit rating. I pay all my bills. I never stiff anybody. And uh, then she said she wouldn't serve me anymore. So I went to see the manager, and the manager said, you didn't do that on purpose. I know you didn't. Here's a man with sense, common sense. And uh, he said, uh, uh, and she said she wouldn't serve me anymore. I told her, I told him, so she told her to, to give me a coffee. I had a coffee. She took the coffee away. Anyway, I, I don't like to complain, but I, I got a, uh, my reputation is what's uh, soil. Just pay your bill like everyone Hey, else. shut up, man. No, you shut up. <laughs> you don't have to get up there. You shut up. Hi. So I've been coming here for a long time, not as long as some, and every once in a while you get a, uh, you get a rebuttal that has nothing to do with the topic. What's that? What's that? Sometimes you get a rebuttal even before the topic began. <laughs> So, how to take care of some of these limited resources. I just don't see a way to do it, but it has Thank to be you. done. Some people think that uh, the corporations are evil, and then you look at what happened in Chernobyl, what happened in the Soviet Union, what happens in China today, or what's going on in Colombia. It's like, no, there's no... Then we have the, uh, the municipality that was south of Chicago that had a chemical spill or something like that had poisonous well water that they were feeding their population, they denied it, and this was not a corporate thing, this was a municipal thing, right? And then as far as corporations, what I didn't get to ask any questions, but as far as corporations, 
if a corporation owned a utility, you would think they would be regulated as a utility. And like, they just can't double the price because they want to and stuff. It's like they're a utility. I didn't have that one answered. Um, because I didn't ask it. Um, so that, that, oh. I guess that's, I, I can't think of anything else, but there, there is, there is no, no, oh, yes, here was the other thing. What recently happened with the gun shooting over in Florida, I forgot the name of the high school, and the way those kids reacted to it, they were brilliant, okay? They went for the throat. They were brilliant. So someone on the news started insulting one of the kids, or they went after her sponsor, she apologized. Okay? I think the protest that we're doing now, and the way we know how to protest, which comes out of the, out of the 50s and 60s, maybe even the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, is old fashioned. Excuse me. One fool at a time, and let's uh, let's let the speaker speak, please. Quiet. Okay. So here to continue. Here's the final thought, gentlemen. Rick, Charlie. Here's the final thought. The kids in Florida, they like, they were like 21st century, you know, Facebook, whatever, you know, phone kids. These kids knew how to do it. They did it right. We're feeling, we are living in a 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all right, 70s, 80s method of protest. And it just doesn't get shit done. You know, it's just co-opted, it just doesn't get shit done, and these kids are showing us how to do it. And if you want to get something done, because I know going with corporations isn't going to do anything, and I know going with municipalities is just the same shit, okay, is that these kids, they're going to show us how to do it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Civil rights movement. Civil rights movement. Hi, I'm Linda Merrick, what? advocate for people with disabilities. My building, the senior building, has very bad water. They didn't let me know about it until it got worse and worse. And I, I got strep throat. My dog got intestinal infection. So I, I'm beginning to think I should be like some of the neighbors and drink beer. <laughs> and I just learned recently that uh, hops has, is in the cannabis family. But uh, I take medication, so. What is the greater risk, the water or the beer? Or cannabis. <laughs> or cannabis, yeah. <laughs> um, that's all for now. I know we're pressed for time. Thank you. Okay, next place. Okay, this is very short. It's a little poem I wrote a little while ago about Trump echoes. Trump talks and tweets. Some people say, yes, he needs to say more of this. Not realizing this adds to the noise and mistrust, so no one can hear or see clearly. So, who do you trust? The person with the loudest voice and angriest voice, or a quiet voice they can all hear and trust? Okay. Next, please. Um, uh, we we're kind of in the same situation as Flint, although it's not quite as bad, but it's pretty bad. The, the problem that I see is uh, in replacing all these pipes is that when you have uh, a city problem that affects almost all the citizens, there's not an easy financial answer to get out of it. I mean, in, in theory, the citizens pay the costs for the uh, for all for any costs that come up. And if you have a previous government that made really poor choices, you're still stuck with the bill. So, um, and my heart goes out to the to all the kids that are basically suffering brain damage by living in a in getting polluted water. In Flint and in the city of Chicago, um, but you know, looking at the city and pointing your finger and saying, "Well, you should pay for it." Well, you know what's going to happen? 
they're going to tax us. So it's we have to pay for it. I don't know the way out of that, but uh, but we shouldn't just sweep it under the rug. It's a big problem. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to address is um, I, I, I talked about this before in the Midwest, where all of the uh, tons of farming is done. There's an the Oglala water filter, which is a massive amount of fresh water that's stored underground. And all these farms out west are just sucking it up and using it to irrigate, irrigate all the crops. And they're saying that it's going to run out in a couple of dozen years. And um, the agribusiness is such a massive political power that I have no confidence that uh, when they run out, they're going to look off to the east at the Great Lakes and start talking about a pipe. Regardless of what laws there are, they're going to change the laws. And if you have a comment about that later, you can address it. But I just don't have any confidence in any law. I think that people like Monsanto and Archer Daniels Midland are going to make sure that the farming agribusiness continues. Um, and then the last thing is, um, I is just a little tip. I uh, I have a water filter at home, but also what I do is they sell these um, uh, like bottled teas, and it's um, it's like a 16 ounce bottle of glass. It's a glass bottle, and I just go out and I have about five of these bottles at home, and I reuse them. So I don't even use plastic to drink fresh water. The risk is that. It, they can break if you drop them, but you're, it's not, uh, the water isn't going to absorb any plastic from the container. So that's a little tip for me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next, please. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank Ms. Rachel Haverlock for her wonderful presentation. Thank you for presenting the facts uh, regarding the flaws, faults, and shortcomings of the uh, water, internal water policies. Uh, I would like to bring up the, an issue regarding the shortcomings, faults, and flaws of water policies overseas. With a focus on Yemen and the water and cholera crisis, um, first of all, I'd like to point out that, um, thank you, that cholera, it's a bacterial, inf oh, this, uh, I'm getting this information from The Guardian. Um, so, it mentions the cholera, a bacterial infection is spread by water containing contaminated feces. It can be easily prevented and easily treated. Cholera first spread from the Ganges Delta in 1817, and the resulting pandemics killed tens of millions of people across the world over 150 years. Modern improvements in water and sanitation infrastructure and Better access to medicines and healthcare have brought a marked fall in the number of cases. Today, outbreaks occur chiefly in areas where water, sanitation, and health systems are inadequate or where they have been destroyed by natural or man-made disasters. So over the past four months, Yemen has been ravaged by a cholera outbreak that the UN brand has branded as the worst in the world. About 7,000 new cases are reported daily. 436,625 have been reported since the end of April, uh, and already, and already there have been more than 1,915 deaths. Um, the epidemic is one aspect of a border humanitarian emergency in Yemen. Two thirds of the population, 18.8 million, requires some form of emergency aid. Food production has collapsed and 4.5 million children and pregnant and lactating women are actually malnourished. Only 45% of health facilities, health facilities are functioning and 14.8 million people lack access to basic health care. About the same number require assistance to act, uh, act access safe drinking water and sanitation. So UN agencies, respected media outlets, including the BBC and the New York Times, and influential medical journals such as the Lancet, Lancet all argue that two, two years of conflict have created conditions conducive to a cholera outbreak. This narrative, while true, tells only part of the story. It fails to account for the possibility that one party might be more culpable for the outbreak than the and the other more affected by it. Um, so, since March of 2015, Saudi Arabia has, has led a coalition of Sunni 
Arab states that has attempted to restore the government using airstrikes, an air and naval blockade, and ground troops. The U.S. and U.K. provide the coalition with logistical support and military equipment. The Saudis, at least 10,000 people have been killed and 40,000 injured in the conflict. Both sides stand accused of disregarding of the well-being of the citizens, civilians, and breaching of international law. Um, okay. I'll just point one main issue is that Obama, the, in December 2016, the Obama administration banned the sale of precision-guided bombs to Saudi Arabia due to concerns about civilian casualties in Yemen. But in May of 2017, the Trump administration agreed to sell $500 million of such weapons as part of a $110 billion deal. And... So people died. <laughs> yeah, so there's been an approximate of 14,000 Yemeni children who are facing cholera and dying from starvation and diarrhea and cholera. And while the U.S. funding of Saudi Arabia is partly responsible for this. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you need alcohol. Okay, let's get the next guy in line. All right. It's always good to have a... Um, oh, by the way, my uh, nephew's throwing out the first pitch at the White Sox game tomorrow. Oh, ooh. He was uh, in the Olympics. He did really poorly. <laughs> Poor you, but what the hell? Uh, very good to have uh, educated... Prof uh, what was your uh, degree in? I didn't hear. Oh, my degree? Um, your PhD? No. Yeah. Your PhD. Yeah. Mike. In the humanities. Humanities. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, you know, one thing about water, Chicago has so much water. I'm really sick of how we have to conserve water in this town because we have plenty of it. And I'm really sick of having all these water fountains turned off. We never had problems before when we had water, water fountains running 24-7. It's not really wasting water. That glass of water will be here millions of years from now. You cannot waste water. It just, it's, it's a regenerative uh, resource. That one right there will be here in a million years, I guarantee you. But oil will not be. It burns up and it's gone forever. Uh, so yeah, I'm your part UIC blood. So you know, you know, we're, we're well educated, we're born. Anyway, um, I have a question about um, is air pollution ever uh, air pollution affecting water? And I was wondering about that. That was one of my. Uh, uh, thoughts today because there's so much air pollution, there's more air pollution than things than water pollution. I think it's about 7 million people die a year from uh, from air pollution. So I was just wondering if air pollution eventually works in the water system. I'm sure it does. Uh, anyway, um, very good. We'll, uh, oil again, oil and Wall Street again are the bad guys. <laughs> So we go to war for oil, we go to war with oil, and they need to be responsible somehow. So keep up the fight. Thank you. I will be quick. Um, Beverly Walter, um, water activist with houses with our water. Uh, our focus has always been on privatization. Uh, one of the concerns that we've had is to make sure that Chicago keeps its water uh, public and that it is not privatized. Um, there's another issue, though, that uh, is very controversial, and that is fluoride. Uh, fluoride is mandated to be put in our water 
It was put in under the uh, pretense that it uh, helps prevent cavities. Studies actually show that that is not statistically proven. Um, but what it does is it saves on some companies a lot of money. It is a byproduct of um, aluminum and uh, fertilizer uh, production, yes. It's highly toxic. People, it's one of the most toxic substances, and it, uh, people have to wear hazmat suits to handle it. But <clears throat> the Rockefellers, who had a big interest in Alcoa, were able to persuade our politicians to put it into our drinking water. And so they say, well, it's just a little bit. But the fact is, is that it accumulates. Now, some of the problems associated with the uh, fluoride in the water or fluoride in our bodies, because it goes into our bodies, especially the bones and the thyroid, are that it can cause problems with the thyroid. This is very personal because I have, I have this, this symptom. It's something that perhaps I wouldn't have to deal with if it weren't for this situation. Also, even though it makes the bones quote unquote stronger, it makes them more brittle. And it unfortunately affects the IQ. And so uh, Dr. Paul Conant, uh, who came out and gave a talk at our conference some years ago, um, noted that studies have shown that it can affect the IQ. It can lower it by up to seven or nine points or so. I know this is heresy to some people, the American Dental Association <laughs> refuses to retract its position, but then let's face it, the American Dental Association has had this position for a long time, and I suppose it would be very embarrassed if it had to retract it. Uh, but very briefly, I want to touch on one other important issue, and that is that there are so many issues. I don't know about you, but I feel very, very much overwhelmed by all the issues. However, a band-aid approach on many of these things is not, I don't think, the answer anymore. I've been thinking about this for quite a while. A uh, number of people have talked about the corporations. As I see it, it goes above the corporations. Who owns the corporations? Do you know the concentration of the ownership of capital on the planet is extraordinary? It's a handful of people, I mean literally a handful of people who own the bulk of the resources of the capital in the entire world. And those people are the people who are controlling our politicians, who have infiltrated our, our religious institutions, have infiltrated our educational system, and have infiltrated our, 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 um, our um, media and Hollywood. No wonder everything is so corrupt. Some of these people are extraordinarily evil. They must know the consequences of what they're doing. So I think what we have to do is to wake up and realize that this, uh, what we could call it the deep state, does indeed exist and that it behooves us to be aware of it and to make decisions based on that knowledge and to take our power back. It is our country, it is our water, it is uh, our resources, and we should demand that uh, the people who are behaving illegally be held accountable. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker uh, Rachel. <laughs> so, uh, the United States leads nations in income and wealth. So, the United States of America should be very proud of how much money it's able to generate. Uh, that's not an easy thing to do, uh, so I guess we should commend. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about the, uh, the last administration and the uh, economic collapse. 
Let's get really specific and say names like Tim Geithner and Larry Summers and Rahm Emanuel. Uh, those are the people in the room when the decisions are made to say, well, Flint, Mission, Michigan is going to happen once in a while. Because they don't live in those communities and they never have and they never will. That's the way greed works. People in power are in power. People with the money and the influence and the wealth have that because it's systematically denied to the people who are working class and middle class community members. And for a very select, elite group of people, never have their children drinking polluted water for some reason. Okay? The United States leads in, in, in generating income and wealth. It also leads in inequality in poverty, in hours worked, in infant mortality, and in weapons manufacturing. So you can see a pattern here where the fork in the road is quite simple if you just know the facts. Of course, I can't blame a lot of Americans for not knowing the facts because we have a media that is literally like a cartoon sometimes. And I mean what we think of as the good media, right? There's the bad media that we all know is terrible, and then there's the F plus choice that we're supposed to believe, oh, now we're getting the real stuff. Well, we're not getting the real stuff either when Flint, Michigan happens, because that's a very, very important thing that you need to be proactive about. You can't be reactive to people drinking clean water or dirty water. It should all be clean water. Um, this, is, this is, you know, what it says in the Constitution in the very beginning. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, provide for the common defense, general welfare, you know, general welfare, more common, you know, more perfect union. That means that we actually have a country where you can drink water and not be poisoned for it. It's a bad time if you believe the lies, if money is all you like. It's a good time to be alive, to have and hold our free minds. It's a great time for we to rise, stay we through the grind. It's a go time for we to fly, remain with peace through your flight. It's a gold cry, we heed the rhyme, to the money pay no mind. The system forgot you and I, yet still we shine, still we're able in bad times. The world's on fire, you are water, organizers are the future. Stars who burn, hearts who serve, to share your works of wonder. With all who searched through the worst, universe of winter. And now, we troubadour the whispers, we troubadour the whispers. The world's on fire, but we are water. Organizers are the present. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Okay, hi, my name is Ellen, and I'm gonna try to give a kind of a short rebuttal. It's gonna be about a different subject. Um, because um, just a few nights ago, um, I often, around 8 o'clock um, or 8.30, I, I like to turn on Democracy Now! on WCPT, uh, the progressive um, radio station. And um, so they had on um, Glenn Greenwald, if you guys are familiar with him, you guys familiar with him, um, who, who kind of blew the Snowden um, story, the um, famous journalist. And um, he was talking about animal abuses and various subjects. And then they said, oh, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to cut away and come back in 60, se 60 seconds. And so, and, and after, after the 60 seconds, he was going to talk about um, Trump Gate, and he was going to talk about Julian Assange. And so, you know, they go to commercial, and then they give all these endless advertisements. I'm like, wait a second. 60 seconds has passed. There's about six minutes left in the program. And just time passes, time passes, time passes. They never go back to democracy now. I don't know if you were listening. Um, you would not have heard this probably if you were watching the TV show, I'm guessing. They never went back. Now, Glenn Greenwald um, does not, he believes that the um, Mueller, and, but he kind of believes it's not really coming up with anything, um, collaboration between Trump and um, Russia. Um, though, and, and, 
so you know he's a controversial figure he doesn't like hold the left wing line hundred percent and I was just completely outraged that they um, either it was a mistake which I think is unlikely, because I've listened to Democracy Now! many, 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 many times on the radio, and they have never cut away and not finished the show. Or I actually think it was censorship. And I, I had actually uh, told my friend to come on and, and listen, and I, I was just completely outraged. I mean, they wanted to censor him because he doesn't toe the party line. And, and I, I think this you know, my friend, one of my friends had been telling me this. He was telling me that on Daily Coast, you know, that famous uh, left-wing website, um, that they are uh, cutting people out of discussions. They're not allowing them to talk um, and, and blog, um, give blog uh, thread responses, you know, or, or maybe post blogs um, if, if they aren't towing the party line, if, they, if they're not you know, and I and I'm just um, and I didn't really believe him, but now when I saw this, when I heard this on Democracy Now, I, I was really shocked. This has never happened before, and I was outraged. So, um, please be aware of this. Thank you. You know, many of you have described a lot of problems today. A lot of things that can go wrong with water, the general malaise that's going around the, the country. But I'm going to say this. We are actually living longer. We are actually having a more healthful world. And if you don't believe me, you can take a, a good look at a book written by an economist by the name of Johan Norberg. It's called Progress. And it really works to bring a little hope to the world. The thing is, is that one of the biggest reasons that we're um, that we are doing so well is because of the process of industrialization. It's because of the process of globalization. And the one thing I don't want to see is that process killed. The thing is, what it all boils down to is the source of energy that we use to power an advanced industrial society. Many of you already know my views about nuclear power, particularly about the molten salt thorium reactor, which I think will power our society for the next 5,000 years, how little waste it makes, and how much it does. One of the benefits of, a, of this kind of power is the sense that it does provide a lot of heat for industrial purposes. And of that, in, in heat, you have to remember that when these things start getting widely deployed, one about the size of this room could power the entire north side of the city of Chicago with about maybe a basketball size of waste after 30 years. If you don't believe me, I encourage you strongly to check it out. Now, with that, that industrial heat could also desalinate water, could also power our advanced industrial society and the more we get you know a little bit more working the more money and the more resources we have to set aside areas for environmentalists one of the best things that ever happened in the county was the development of the forest preserve and the only reason we have that is because of the planning that was done in the 1910s and early teens that really brought it to fruition and they're doing a good job in managing it um, this now, I will conclude with this. There is always hope out there. I have to commend our speaker tonight for showing me some stuff that I didn't even know existed with the Google Docs and the uh, things like this. And I'm going to be sharing a lot of these tools with my Toastmasters organizations of people who don't know this stuff. I would like to extend again just another round of applause for our speaker. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank our speaker too. Thank you. But anyhow, uh, Tim, while you're searching the internet, why don't you look up Fukushima and what's going on with water there? I think it was it like 500,000 gallons a day are uh, made radioactive. If you drink a glass of it, you will uh, glow in the dark and things like that. <laughs> so you're an advocate of more reactors. Yes, that should be the right kind of reactors, beneficial. Charlie. I polluted the entire Pacific Ocean. 
Are you not aware of that? Did yes. you, were you, did you be for the day and sure miss the news <laughs> on this that's been around for years? And that radiation and is not going to affect do wildlife. And another machine that does this. Anyhow, I see Beverly's here. Beverly Burr is very active and should be recognized. I know. You were what happened to you? She was with Kapow. Yes. Citizens <laughs> uh, against privatization of water. And I was, I remember this, I was reprimanded because when they spoke, I only put C-A-P-A-W and they said it's all capital letters with an exclamation point. <laughs> uh, I forget what else I was going to talk about. Oh, the thing about pipelines. Does anybody know what, where Cushing, why Cushing, Oklahoma is important? I've actually been there. Yes, it is the pipeline capital in the world. The price of crude oil is based on all the lines converged there. And the, it's called the price at Cushing. And I've had occasion, it's in, other than that, it's a no place. The other thing about pipelines, this is nobody wants to talk about, is that if you don't if you don't use pipelines, guess what you use? To Rail ship oil. Yes. Rail. Crude oil tank cars. Rail oil. And guess what happens to crude oil tank cars? They go down in the valley. All and the go more to the river. All the more reason yeah, to power Korea, society by thorium, Charlie. Put it to the hot like a Fourth of July hot dog. They cook you. Now, I, I, if this is an alternative to pipelines. I don't know. I, I could go on about why there hasn't been any. But your accidents. railroad infrastructure gets upgraded and you can then transport That's passengers. That's partially what they're doing, too. They also have some nifty things with the cars. I don't know, a guy designed this. If they have an accident, they just slowly roll over one after another, like taking a nap. The entire train will do that. A hundred cars. It's amazing to watch, but it actually does work. Anyhow, thank you very much. You know, and uh, I'm getting like that crazy guy back there. I ended up here's a program on water, and I started talking about oil. All right, thank you very much. Come again. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, some years ago, Congressman Dick Arney. Remember him? The House Majority Leader from Texas? All right. I forget whether this happened before or after he retired. But he went up to Michigan to help some Republican congressional candidate. So he looked around at Lake Michigan and he said, you folks have got to guard your Great Lakes. I'm from Texas. Down there we know that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. And when we come up here, we're not going to buy it. We're going to steal it. And I think that should be put up on signs of the school, office, home, business in the Great Lakes Basin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rachel, for a tremendous presentation. You're the last one, right, Andy? Yeah. Okay. And then we'll, uh, Rachel gets we'll the last word. A couple minutes here. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I'll try to mention a couple of things. Uh, hold on, I'm going to shut this off. For those, those people that said the situation was hopeless, uh, there's a website called Want to Know Info. It's the single most hopeful site I have ever seen on the internet. There's about 12 different disciplines, activists that have produced a huge body of evidence of hopeful things like what Rachel talked about tonight, people working toward good things, trying to stop pipelines from being built, alternative energy. Uh, many people are not aware that the Trump administration is just trying to pass a rule so that they will give welfare dollars to coal and oil plants that are no longer competitive with solar and wind and the renewables. So they're going to try to subsidize now the dirtier, more expensive energy sources everywhere in America to uh, fund money to the billionaire coal cutters, what I call billionaire predators. Uh, for those of you that didn't know it, the Bush administration, uh, w. George W. Bush, before they left office, 
George W. and his family bought 98,000 acres of land in a corner of Paraguay. It's the last large, clean aquifer for fresh water in the world. Fracking, we talked about this, but the media runs a blackout. I talk about censored news out of California all the time. That book that comes out in October every year with the top 25 censored stories from the journalism school. Well, one of the top stories that you can't talk about on the news media in America is that fracking is not about energy. It's about destroying the water tables to create the next gold rush in clean water after there's no more gold rush for oil. Oil is, fossil fuels are obsolete, and everybody that studies it knows this, and they're, they're economically obsolete now. So they are positioning themselves to destroy, it's been known since they started fracking, that fracking destroys the water tables, contaminates them. There's an article on June 1st, for those of you that want to know what's going on, the game plan, uh, it's James, a woman named Lynn Stewart Paramo, Paramo published an article that's on Smirking Chimp, June 1st. It's about James, uh, what is his full name? J James McGill Buchanan. He was the original, uh, the one you don't hear about. We hear about Milton Friedman and uh, these other free market. Well, James Buchanan produced the blueprint for changing the Constitution and privatizing certain things and changing the Constitution itself once you get 37 or 38 states so that the middle class could never vote uh, for democracy again in any way, shape, or form. So uh, look up that article. I'll have copies of it. Uh, also, uh, those of you uh, should study the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society packing the courts with judges has been funded all along by the Koch brothers. Okay. okay, so there we are. Uh, those four, come to my talk on August 25th if anybody's interested. We'll have written, printed material on this and a bunch of other things that are, will give people a okay. message of hope for the future. Speaker Thank gets you. the yeah. last word. You're up. Uh, so give us a summary okay. or answer any of the you know, rebuttals that you want. <laughs> okay, I'll be brief because the evening is uh, waning. Uh, Flynn came up a few times. I want to um, draw attention. There's a great book coming out just now named The Poison. But what's important to realize about Flint are two things. And the first one is the Michigan Emergency Manager Law. When Rick Snyder, the Republican governor, came into office, he passed a law which allowed for the governor to replace the democratically elected mayors and for an emergency manager to be there. The overwhelming um, communities uh, that received an emergency manager were majority communities of color. And uh, some of these mayors that were displaced or brought their city back to, to uh, representative democracy said that what happened under the emergency manager was a loosening of the assets. So I, I want to get to Flynn really quickly because it actually wasn't the municipality. It was an emergency manager who made the decision to take Flint off the supply of the Detroit River intake. At the time at which they switched the supply and there was no democratically elected mayor, they brought in a multinational named Veolia. Veolia, Suez, American Water, these are the corporations that privatize municipal water. So it's very important because the optics of it was, oh, this is a poor, working class, majority black city. They can't run their water, which is not seeing. And, and the lawsuit right now implicates the emergency manager as well as Veolia, which was brought on at the point when the phosphate, the anti-corrosive, was no longer added to their water. So we definitely have the hand of global water privatizers in there. Um, so the point about the pipes in Chicago, it's actually not such a hard question. Because our water mains are being replaced not because they're bad metals or dangerous, but because they leak. And so the point that we're all making is that if $760 million has been borrowed to do this, then just go when you replace a main 
work in conjunction with the homeowner to replace the service lines. So instead of saying we're doing all the mains in one summer, you move more slowly in conjunction with the homeowners. The city of Milwaukee is splitting the cost uh, with homeowners and allowing people to pay it off in escrow over years. So, you know, what we're saying to the city is not don't replace the mains and not we shouldn't pay, but just let's do this program in conjunction at the same time so that the water supply is good and, um, and the pipes are good. And someone pointed out to me as we were trying to think through the cost of it, he said, you know, every single L stop um, or covered bus station that we do, and I am not against these things, but we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. So it's important to see the money's there and the program is being done in a way that's not conducive or beneficial to people. Um, they can't tax us for it, um, as I learned. The Department of Water Management is not a taxing body. Um, and so they also can't just pay for it because it would benefit those with a lead line and not those without. So in other words, the proposal for Chicago's lead pipes is that when a main is replaced, you knock on the doors. First of all, nobody knows that when the mains are replaced and you have a lead service line that you're at greater risk. First of all, you tell people. And second of all, you say, here's our program. Right? We'll replace it. We'll do half the cost. We'll go a little slower with the mains. Um, and we'll work with some kind of cost sharing program. Um, so I think that's it. Um, I think that we have a good water supply. I think that um, it will not be taken by the Texans. And that we just have to urge on, um, make sure that we urge on those um, stewards of our water in the government offices to work together with us um, for that best supply. So thanks for the comments. Um, and the passion, and really nice to have had the evening. Before we go, can you give us a little bit about your background? Just a little bit about your background and why you got into this in the first place? Oh, I got into this, um, uh, I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and the, uh, the water always called to me, like meaning come in me and swim. Uh, so I was always drawn to fresh water, which meant if you're from Detroit, Michigan, you swim in the Detroit River at Lake Erie. Um, so uh, for a long time, it was, um, you know, really like an outdoor interest. And, um, and my first area of research was actually in the Middle East. And when I was over there, I got involved with projects of peace building through water sharing. And then I came home and I was like, well, we're not at war and we don't have scarcity, but how do you work together with different communities to ensure safe, affordable, accessible public water? And so um, after coming back from uh, some time in the Middle East in 2013, um, a bunch of us started the UIC Freshwater Lab to start working, studying these issues, and working on communication and policy. All right. Thank you. Andy, give a little Thank you. Okay, folks, that's it for the College of Complexes on June 1st here. June 2nd, actually, right? So we'll see you next week on June 9th. Thank you, and we're adjourned.